This meeting is now being recorded. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Office of Information Management and Analysis Brown Bag Series. So, uh, in the interest of time, because Robin has a, a lot of material to cover, I go directly to introduce uh, to introducing her. Uh, Dr. Robin Stewart has been a research hydrologist with USGS National Research Program since uh, 2003. She received an undergraduate degree in biology from the University of uh, Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, and a PhD in ecotoxicology from the University of Manitoba. She did postdoctoral with Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans. In her postdoctoral uh, time, she evaluated the fate and transport of organic contaminants during the 1997 Red River flood. For the past 20 years, Robin's research has focused on identifying and understanding processes influencing the fate and bioavailability of selenium mercury, and organic contaminants in food webs across a range of aquatic environments, including estuaries, lakes, and tidal rivers and reservoirs. She, she strives to identify critical processes controlling the contaminants bioaccumulation in nature. With this brief introduction, I will pass the phone line to Robin to start her presentation. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, thanking DOET for, and the State Water Board for inviting me to speak about how science can inform policy and support effective management decisions. Uh, this is a topic that I'm not only very passionate about, but one that I've been contemplating over the past decade and perhaps obsessing over in the past few years. Regardless of the organization you happen to be working for, whether it's industry, nonprofit, private consulting, or academia, or government like me, funds for basic research are limited and are likely to be even more limited in the future. So given that we can't do everything, what science should we be doing, and what is the value of the information that we already have? Um, so today I'm going to talk specifically about selenium. Uh, as Dawit indicated, I, I also work on mercury and I have a history of also working on organics. But today we're going to talk about selenium. Selenium is an element, has been referred to as a sulfur analog. It's a nutrient required for antioxidant enzymes. But at elevated concentrations, it can substitute for sulfur and disrupt the formation of protein structures causing deformities in developing organisms. I call it the groundhog element in this region because it is a persistent problem that regulators have had to address over the past 50 plus years due to the fact that there is selenium enriched waste that is generated from core economic activities including oil refining, mining, agriculture, and coal fire production that must be managed. This waste has the potential to cause significant impacts on fish and wildlife, and based on what we know from other cases of selenium toxicity, such as in Blues Lake, North Carolina, and what happened in Kesterson in the Central Valley, the effects can occur rapidly and can be catastrophic. Lastly, the ecotoxicology of selenium in nature is complicated and influenced by a range of biochemical, hydrological, and ecological processes, which are continuously changing in the San Francisco Bay and Delta due to changes in climate, invasive species, and infrastructure management, to name a few. We need to be prepared uh, that ex the exposure landscape could change in the future. So the goal of our research at the USGS is to provide the nation's resource managers and policymakers with the scientific information they need to anticipate, plan for, and adapt for changes affecting water quality and availability as they unfold in the 20th century. Over the past 50 years, we observed a truly, in my, my feeling, we've observed a truly remarkable evolution of regulatory approaches in dealing with selenium toxicity. Following a pretty rough period in the late 70s and 80s, uh, following the toxicological events at Blues Lake and Kesterson, the EPA conducted a comprehensive literature review to produce 
a revised national freshwater criterion for selenium. This was five micrograms per liter. What I found really interesting about this is that while this value served the purpose of setting a point of regulation, it stimulated many follow-up studies to evaluate its appropriateness for the protection of aquatic life. Not surprisingly, there were two diverging schools of thoughts, thought. One thought it was too high, as in the case of winter stress syndrome that resulted in greater sensitivity to selenium exposures at lower concentrations, and also in waters receiving agriculture drainage where they saw evidence of toxicity at lower concentrations. But in a number of Colorado streams, uh, where there were considerably higher selenium concentrations, they observed no evidence of selenium toxicity. In a position paper in 1997, Dennis Lemley addressed this growing body of evidence illustrating a divergence of outcomes for selenium in a range of environments by recognizing the importance of site-specific and species-specific influences on selenium bioaccumulation and toxicity. His conclusion was that a single national criterion may not really be appropriate. Since, um, so since the, uh, Dennis wrote that paper, there have been significant steps towards developing the concepts of a site-specific criteria that take into consideration local processes and data. I think one of the best examples um, of late is the ecosystem scale model developed by Tree Suppressor and Sam Luom at the USGS. It links key processes with high quality data uh, to exposure and effects for a specific ecosystem to establish a range of responses within those processes and data ranges. But the challenge of this kind of site-specific guideline is that they require an excellent understanding of critical processes influencing selenium in any particular system, and they need high-quality exposure data to populate the model. So in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Delta, EPA has currently proposed a site-specific set of criteria, and it has relied on a detailed understanding of selenium dynamics in the system. This understanding was made possible through a combination of research approaches by a large body of researchers, not just USGS, academia, state, et cetera, uh, that include monitoring data or data collection, process studies, and modeling and integration efforts, including the development of uh, the ecosystem model. Today, I wanted to highlight some of our key and critical findings through each of these approaches that have supported the development of the site-specific criteria and play a key role in understanding how the system might respond in the future. So first, I'm going to start with monitoring. So monitoring, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is honestly one of the toughest of all approaches as it requires a stable funding source and continued commitment of time every month or on whatever time scales it, it, it's at. But the really great thing about long-term monitoring is that its value increases with time. In many ways, monitoring is the backbone of environmental research because it provides a baseline from which to detect change. It can be used to identify sources of variability and thus highlight important processes that require further investigation. And they are also critical for challenging our, our existing assumptions based on current understanding. But what's really important, and there's a lot of monitoring data out there, is that you have to work with it. So I'm going to show you what some of the things that we've learned from our monitoring data. In 1995, Tim Loam at the USGS initiated a CLAM selenium monitoring program where samples were collected monthly up until this past September for a total of 22 years. This program has been hailed as one of the best in the world for this kind of ecotoxicological eco information. Its value is in its design, whereby it's allowed us to identify and quantify multiple scales of variability in selenium exposures that play an important role in determining risk of selenium to top predators in the system. This plot shows soft tissue selenium concentrations in Potamocorbulam urensis collected monthly at a station in Carquina Strait near the confluence, as well as one near the delta. Um, so first, 
uh, just emphasizing sort of the aspects of the design, is that we collect multiple replicate composites representing different size classes. And those are the, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but those are the means. Um, uh, sorry, uh, collect mouse. Um, Sorry, those are the means, plus or minus the standard deviations. And we collect monthly to understand how selenium exposures change throughout the year, which is important for linking exposures to ecologically relevant periods of time for native species. We also collect for, we have collected for a minimum of years to capture some of the largest variations in climate variability and changes in water management actions. And we also collect at multiple locations in the bay to capture the range of exposure conditions to which the organisms are exposed. In terms of uh, what we've learned about individuals is that we knew that there could be a size effect of different individuals based on lab studies, but it was unclear how it would manifest itself in the field. Through our monitoring approach, we found that in certain locations and at certain times of year, typically when, we, when concentrations are changing in response to hydrologic conditions, Selenium concentrations were found to be higher in smaller bivalves than in larger bivalves. This is because the filtration rates by size do not scale proportionally with body mass. So when presented with a new source of selenium, the smaller clams responded more quickly. Eventually, in time, within a matter of, of weeks to months, they all, all the different sizes of clams came to the same steady state until the system changed again. This difference in size, we also found, was not trivial, resulting in differences in exposures of up to over 30% in selenium concentrations over a four millimeter difference in clam length. So if you're trying to identify differences in location or through time, size could confound your, your interpretation. Next, seasonal. Uh, in looking at seasonal variation, these are looking at month-to-month -month variation, we also found that selenium concentrations would vary seasonally due to the fact that unlike mercury, selenium is lost and accumulated on the order of weeks. This plot shows mean selenium concentrations for individual months over the entire 22-year period, which are represented by the standard deviations. You'll notice that concentrations tended to be higher in the fall months during low flow periods and lower during the spring months during high flow. But what is an even more important finding was that, and that has implications for any regulation, is that there was huge variation among different years. So in looking at year-to-year -year variation, these plots show the difference in monthly mean selenium concentrations in clams at Carquina Strait broken out by wet and critically dry years. As we know, hydrologic conditions vary considerably in the San Francisco Bay and Delta and have the potential to change as a result of future conveyance alterations. The monitoring data that we've, we've collected indicate that water year influences not only the magnitude of the seasonal variation, but annual averages, annual averages of seasonal uh, selenium, ex selenium exposures. Wet years resulted in more month-to-month -month variation, as you'll see in the, the, the middle plot, uh, in, uh, with selenium concentrations climbing in the spring with the lowest values in May. During the latest drought, we learned that not only were selenium concentrations elevated over the wet years, but they were persistently elevated. So year-to-year -year variation had the potential to be greater than seasonal variation, and that critically dry years represent uh, essentially the wor worst case scenario to date. So briefly, spatially, what we learned also is that we've observed a highly persistent pattern uh, of selenium concentrations in Carquina Strait that exceed those closest to the delta. What this plot shows is basically the selenium concentrations at station at, at the Carquina State, state Carquina Station minus those at the confluence, and you will see that although that there is some variation and that you get convergence at certain points in time, they are persistently elevated, and um, this is a pattern that we are working to explain more thoroughly and mechanistically through the use of a model, which I'll explain a little bit later. Okay, process studies. 
Process studies provide a, a really great opportunity to explain some of the variation we observed in monitoring and to quantify rates and constants that could be more broadly applicable and applied within a, a site-specific criterion. So there isn't, unfortunately, enough time today to go into many of the uh, important and insightful processes influencing flame exposures, but I want to give you two really critical examples. Uh, the first example is what we learned about the incredible variation in physiological uptake among invertebrates and its consequences for predator exposures. When I first started working on selenium in, in the bay, there were large apparent differences in selenium exposures in top predators, striped bass and, and sturgeon, which ran counter to how typically we viewed biomagnification of contaminants in food webs by studying mercury and persistent organic pollutants. Here we found that a top predator, striped bass, had lower concentrations in selenium than white sturgeon that we knew fed lower in the food web. Further, we observed a factor increase in selenium concentrations in just one species, the sturgeon, following the introduction of the Asian clam Potama corbula, suggesting that this clam might offer some insight into these apparent differences. Using uh, the biodynamic model, which is a physiological model to evaluate physiological uptake and loss among the different species of vertebrates, Fellow postdocs in Sam Luoma's lab, including Chris Schleicher and Beyong Lee, found that there were marked differences among invertebrates. Specifically, they found that bivalves, uh, Potamic corbulae here, assimilate, assimilated uh, the same per, uh, at a similar percentage rate as crustaceans, such as copepods and, and mycid shrimp, but they lost selenium at a much lower rate. <clears throat> leading to a, a factor higher in selenium concentrations in their tissues. So this was really helpful in understanding how uh, their predators had different concentrations at the, the top of the food web. So unlike mercury, the key to understanding predatory exposures of selenium was identifying their invertebrate prey as well as the prey's physiological uptake of selenium. This plot shows higher biomagnification of selenium through a clam-based food web compared to a crustacean-based food web. And very briefly, another process that we learned uh, that was really important uh, by partnering with fish biologists in Peter Moyle's lab, including Fred Fira, was that ecology and life history could have profound impacts on selenium exposures. This plot shows liver selenium concentrations in different size classes of Sacramento split tail, indicating a near doubling of selenium concentrations in fish exceeding five centimeters in length, which happens to be the point at which this species has known to show a significant increase in bivalves in their diet. So from this, we learned that diet characterization is a critical step in any predator selenium exposure characterization. And to take this a step further, we recently showed that the elevated selenium concentrations in the bivalves in San Francisco Bay was evident in the split, in split tail that predominantly forged in the bay. And this is through, again, another collaborative study with Fred Rira and Rachel Johnson that we're, we're actually wrapping up right now. This plot shows ovary selenium concentrations in split tail plotted against sulfur, their, their sulfur isotopic signature in their tissues. The other important information in the study was that not, it showed, the isotopic signature shows relative to their selenium concentrations that fish foraging in the bay, in certain regions of the bay, had selenium at levels that could be of concern, but it was only at certain areas of the bay. And so this provided some perspective about how overall populations were being exposed to selenium throughout the region. And that's really important to determine overall population risk. Okay, next I'd like to uh, finish up with modeling and, um, and what I want to say is that this approach depends heavily on both monitoring data and also process studies. Uh, and, you know, it is, in turn, an extremely useful tool to quantify how well we understand the problem and then can anticipate uh, changes in the future. But, but again, what's really important, there's, 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 
I see a lot of a shift towards we're going to do more and more modeling, which is very important, but the modeling is only as effective and useful as the monitoring data and the, the, the quality of the data and understanding the processes that are building it. So it can't be done in absence of the other processes or other types of research. Okay, so we do know that regional selenium exposures are strongly influenced by sources and hydrodynamic processes that act on them and that they will change in time and space. So in the region, we know that there are inputs from uh, dischargers, uh, natural inputs from the ocean, from the Sacramento, and from the San Joaquin River bringing in uh, agriculture irrigation drainage water. So for this reason, the USGS has invested heavily in a modeling framework that builds on a detailed three-dimensional hydrodynamic model of the Bay Delta Ocean called DFLOW FM, or flexible mesh. The model receives freshwater inflows from the watershed and, uh, and oceans and propagates them through the delta and bay, taking into consideration water the influence of the water operations, tides, bathymetry, among other processes. The hydrologic data that is generated from the model includes stage and flow, are then input into another water quality model called DELWAC that introduces selenium loads from different sources to track how selenium is, dis is distributed in time and space. This modeling effort is still being refined and developed, but initial efforts led by Jim, James Bishop and myself and others at the USGS have provided critical insight into how sources and transport impact selenium exposures in the system. So this map shows simulated total dissolved selenium concentrations in water throughout the bay in February of 2011. While tweaks are still being done, the model reproduces many of the spatial and temporal variations in selenium exposures we've observed in the clams. This includes a concentration of selenium in North Bay and in the, in the San Joaquin River. This map overlays selenium concentration in Potamacorbula that we've collected uh, from multiple locations throughout the bay in the fall, specifically in October, in years spanning anywhere from 1995 through 2016. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of different studies that we've done. So what, in combination of, of the, the, the monitoring data and the modeling, is that it allows us to expand our exposure maps with simulated concentrations, which will be really important for understanding larger impacts uh, on, on greater populations. So, in summary, our monitoring has, uh, has shown us that freshwater inflow are really important under, in understanding changes in selenium exposures from year to year. The modeling that we've done will also allow us to look into the future and e evaluate how differences in environmental conditions, such as selenium loading, different sources, will be distributed throughout the ecosystem and how that could alter selenium exposures in predators. And uh, as I've indicated here, there are a couple of, of specific scenarios that we are currently looking at, including increasing warming temperatures, sea level rise that result in levee failure, uh, and then also alternative conveyance structures, which will be very important. In the summary, I think the, the selenium story and the, the selenium issue uh, illustrates how effective science and a range of approaches has provided regulators with critical information to develop more effective regulatory policies. So with that, I will uh, leave you with a haiku, which I think if you, you gotta be able to sum up everything you're gonna say in three lines, um, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think you, people can come, go ahead and ask a question. In the meantime, people on the phone will be unmuted. All guests have All been guests unmuted. Have been unmuted. Great. So feel free to ask uh, Robin. So Robin, uh, looking at the fact that selenium concentrations increase seaward, that selenium concentrations increase in dry years, what's the source of the bioavailable selenium? Well, you know, 
Oh, there's a bit of an echo. Hopefully, you can. Um, what, what we, you know, we, there are a number of potential uh, sources of selenium, and I think that that's one of the things that we've really learned from this modeling effort, is that there are a number of different sources that combine together to result in the kind of concentrations that we're seeing in the clam. So, for example, at Cartina Strait, the, mo the pr modeling that, that James Bishop has said so far is that we see that there is a summing of ocean sources of selenium, Sacramento, San Joaquin, and then the discharger sources of selenium right in the Carquinez Strait area. So it depends on where you are, which sources are going to be more important. And again, the modeling effort that takes into consideration the really uh, intensive influence of physical transport processes to help us understand relative importance of these different sources. I have a question about this. I have a question from the public chat. <coughs> Stated concentrations, elevated dry years, please explain the mechanism, speculation, lack of dilution. Yes, it sure looks like that. And so, you know, that that's the first simplest, best ex explanation is that because, you know, when you look at wet years, you see, you know, elevated concentrations during low flow periods and then a decline through time. And this is a process that's repeated itself time and time again over this long uh, monitoring history. And so that w during the drought where we lost those flow, larger flow periods, it began to look, um, you know, the, the spring became essentially the fall. There was no difference. We lost all seasonality. And so our, our current understanding is that uh, it's a lack of dilution of the internal sources in the bay. Ah. Uh, any more questions for Robin? I think there. Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, Robin, for agreeing to do this. And thank you all for participating. All right. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you.